to you tonight now um, on graphic medicine at work. And we're absolutely delighted uh, to welcome three wonderful speakers. Dr. Muna Al-Jawad, who's um, a colleague of ours, a consultant in elderly medicine at Brighton Sussex University Hospital Trust. And then two graphic artists, Nicholas Street and Nye Wright. And I'm sure they'll introduce themselves as they speak. Uh, we're going to start with Muna and then go on to uh, Nicola and then Nye. And then when everybody's done their presentations, they're going to answer questions from the front. And Bobby Farsidi, my colleague here, will be chairing the discussion. So we'd ask you to have lots of questions ready, but to um, keep them all until the panel discussion. Um, we are recording this event because we've been asked to provide it as a podcast um, for various comic medicine uh, fora. And uh, so please be aware of that uh, when you're speaking. We will be recording you. Um, if you've got any objections to that, tell us at the end, but I'm not sure if we've got the technology to cut you out. We'll do our <laughs> So, um, without further ado, on to you. Um, thanks, Sue. Um, so, hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, as you said, I'm a, I'm a winner. I'm a consultant in elderly medicine, um, and I work at Brighton. Um, over the next 20 minutes, um, I'm going to hopefully convince you that comics are good for your health um, and show you that you can use visual narratives to explore clinical practice. So I come very much at this from a clinician perspective. Um, the old person whisperer thing, um, I'll explain in a bit more detail, but it's basically my comics alter ego is old person whisperer because um, I'm a very Christian. Um, I started drawing comics um, only about two or three years ago um, as part of a master's in education and I used comics in my dissertation. I used them as a research method and used them in my dissertation so I'm happy to talk about that more. That kind of comes out a bit I think through the talk as well. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, just a bit about me and, and what I do, then a bit about what I mean by exploring clinical practice, a little bit, a little bit about visual images and comics and then argue why comics are good for your health. Um, so I used to do, because I, I presented a few times back, but I used to do kind of a real life strip of, of, of how I came to geriatric medicine, how I came to qualitative research, but I think doing comics has slightly warped me. So, um, so now my strip is, a, is, is about old person whisperer. So this is about me really, and, and about how geriatricians really see themselves. It's called super geriatrics. So behold the geriatrician, she looks like a normal doctor. Um, but she was bitten by an old lady, as an SHO, um, and became old person whisperer. Fighting old people's distress. So the old lady says, help, help. And the poor junior doctor says, I can't take a history, she's too agitated. And then bam, old person whisperer on the scene. How are you, Mrs. Jones? Um, talks to the patient. She's upset because she's broken her hip and has pneumonia. Thanks, old person whisperer. <laughs> um, Another thing, I do saving old people from orthopods. <laughs> Sorry to any orthopedic surgeons in the audience. Um, so there's an old lady not looking very well. Orthopedic woman says, I think I'll give her some more IV fluid. Um, Hiya! Old person whisperer ninja kicks um, the orthopedic doctor out of the way. Um, I think you've got fluid on your lungs, so I gave you a medication for it. Thanks, old person whisperer. It's the old lady. Um, and defending justice for old people. So this is maybe a social worker, sorry to any social workers in the world. Um, I think you need to go to a nursing home. No, says the old man. Not so fast, says old person whisperer. The team will get you home with some help. And that's the physiotherapist, occupational therapist, and the rest of the hospital team. Thanks, old person whisperer. So then when I was drawing this comic, I had to come up with a punchline. So um, I was trying to think of superheroes, so I went for... Um, Kryptonite. Of course, all, all superheroes have their kryptonite. Um, and this is my email inbox. Management wants a meeting about those audit figures as soon as possible. And I'm saying, ah! So that's my weakness, I guess, geriatric medicine. Never looks good to managers. Um, so that's about me. Um, so now I'd like to explain a bit what I mean about exploring clinical practice. Um, this is some um, art by Shrigley, David Shrigley, um, who some of you might know, and I really like David Shrigley, I think it's great. Um, so this is um, his take on reflection, so time to reflect. Um, and I, I just think it's, I think it's really funny, but anyway. Um, so <laughs> reflection is, is a really popular thing now, is in education we're all told, oh, you must reflect, you know, it's very important, you'll learn only if you reflect. Um, but, and sometimes it does feel slightly like what's 
point, you know, if you're just going to reflect exactly yourself the other way around, then there isn't really much point to it, I feel. Um, I think the point of reflection is to get under the surface and to see something, something else, not just yourself in the mirror. Um, so this next comic, um, I'll show you big first, but then I'll show you frame by frame. I did this um, yeah. as part of my research, and I think it is, it is reflection, really. So it, this was me following a ward round and writing notes as to what was happening in the ward round, just to try and look at what geriatric medicine is. Um, so it goes, a geriatrician trying to start his ward round um, without losing patience. That's a pun, losing <laughs> That. <laughs> um, this is the hospital, um, and this is the hospital down at the county. I can't pretend it's not, um, and that's the geriatric ward in the really rubbishy bit of the hospital. Uh, starting the ward round, so there's a consultant, an SD2, who's a junior doctor, and there's the patients. Losing patients. Where was Mrs. L, who was in bed one? Ward clerk <coughs> says, bed manager moved her. Oh, for God's sake. Okay, let's see the new lady in bed one then. For God's sake, help me, said the lady in bed 15. Ring, ring, says the phone. <laughs> Losing nurses. Hello? Oh, Mrs. P's daughter. Um, I'll just get a nurse. W what do you want help with? I don't know. Help me. I'll get a nurse. But they can't find the nurses. Please, God Almighty. Right, let's see bed one. Please, God Almighty, help me, says the lady in bed 15. <laughs> Losing patients too. Where is the lady in bed one? They say to a passing nurse, sorry I don't work here, she says, please help, says the lady in bed 15. How will it end? Will the consultant find his patient? Will they find a nurse? Will the registrar turn up? Will they see all the patients before the consultant's meeting at 11? Will someone help the lady in bed 15, please? Um, so when I drew this comic, I suddenly realised how angry I was um, and how frustrated at the care that elderly people get in hospital. And I don't think just writing it as field notes, it hadn't quite come out. I think it kind of needed the comic and to turn it into the narrative to make the reflection a kind of critical reflection, so a reflection that went a bit deeper than just looking in the mirror. Um, so next, something about visual images. Um, and I guess really more about comics than just visual images. So this is James Pachapa, um, who's a comics book artist who I really like as well. Um, and it's from the Cute Manifesto. And he's writing about um, what comics are, like what, why comics are special and what comics are. He says, art is not a way of conveying information. It's a way of understanding information. That is, creating a work of art is a means we have of making sense of the world, focusing to make it clearer, <coughs> not a way of communicating some understanding of the world we already hold. Um, and I think that's what comics are to me. It's not just expressing something that I already knew. It's exploring it um, and looking a bit deeper into it. Um, and this is a Venn diagram for my sister. My sister's a scientist, she's a physicist. Um, and I, I did this talk for her as like a practice for, for doing this. And she, she was really trying to make it, so, you know, trying to understand and make it science -y. So what she reckons <laughs> is that <laughs> comics and medicine overlap because um, you use images in both, so obviously comics are about images, but medicine we have the clinical examination, we use physical signs, we use x-rays and things like that, so that's kind of images. And then both use narratives, so both are about stories, so in medicine we take a history, and obviously comics are all about stories. Um, and then both have either humour or humanity somewhere in them, and she reckons that that's the kind of intersection overlap of comics and medicine. So that's kind of something about maybe why comics feel like they are quite a natural medium for me as a doctor. Okay, so why are comics good for your health? Um, so I'm going to use examples from my comics to illustrate um, aspects of this proposition. So comics can be like a journal. This is a comic I did fairly recently. Um, <clears throat> I've only been a consultant for six months, so it's a, a new job for me. Um, and it's kind of quite a big step from being a junior doctor to being a consultant. So this is about that. So this is called Old Person Whisperer is Managing Expectations. Um, and this is me with a crown saying you may kiss the green to a junior doctor. Um, so this is maybe my friend. So Old Person Whisperer, you've reached the pinnacle of your career. A consultant. How's it going? That's me. It's okay, I suppose. You must have got a smart new wardrobe. That's me with shoulder pads. I did think of just 
wearing the same clothes I was wearing from the shoulder pads. <laughs> so she imagines being in shoulder pads. <coughs> well, I did buy something from Bowdoin. <laughs> ah, this bastard cardigan has no pocket for my phone. <laughs> Your team must love and respect you, she imagines me on a sedan chair being carried by the <laughs> doctors. Let us carry you to the patients. Let me hold your phone. <laughs> Reality, uh, kind of. Hey team, shall we go to the pub after work? I'm on call, <laughs> I have to study. Do we have to? <laughs> and with your new power, you probably have no need to ninja kick anymore. She imagines me saying, make it so, and the team going, yes boss. Actually, I'm trying to develop a new superpower, um, which is email ninja. <laughs> so the email says, re come to yet another meeting, and there's me ninja kicking kapow through the computer screen. So I can fight baddies in one click. <laughs> and so that's kind of comics as journal. Comics as me thinking about what's going on in my life at the moment and kind of almost making a diary of it. Um, comics I've also used to link theory and practice. Um, so this comic's called Giving a Shit and it's about virtue ethics um, and during my dissertation I thought about um, what my moral <coughs> values were, where I was coming from, what was my moral standpoint and I had big anxiety about whether I was a Kantian or a utilitarian and I really tried to think about that a lot and in the end I came up with virtue, or I read about virtue ethics and thought that that might be a way to think about ethics in clinical practice and that kind of work for me. And virtue ethics is um, the what would Gandhi do style of ethics. You know, it's rather than following rule-based theory, it's kind of a what would insert person do in this situation um, type ethical theory. So this is the boss's wardrobe two weeks ago. I was a registrar when I wrote this. Um, hello, Mrs. Barnaby, that's the boss. And that's me and that's another doctor. Um, and then, unfortunately, Mrs. Barnaby was incontinent. Oh, no. Let's get a nurse, quick, and then the other doctor run off. Um, and when we came back with the nurse, the boss was on the floor cleaning up the poo. Can't help you. And then two weeks later on the ward, uh, doctor, that's one of my patients, uh, yes, Mr. Gilhooley, doctor. There was kind of a wafty, whiffy smell coming from Mr. Gilhooley. I'm not sure what you want, but I have to go. I'm very busy. He, he, says Mr. Gilhooley. And then I turned round and Dr. <laughs> Mr. Gilhooley had a poo in his hand. <laughs> That's true. Um, so I thought, yuck, obviously. Where's the nurse? Obviously. <laughs> then I remembered the boss a few weeks ago. And then, oh no, <laughs> realised what I have to do helped me. So virtue ethics in practice, linking practice and theory. Um, Comics can be a way to understand why practice is difficult. Um, and practice is very difficult, but we often don't really think about why that is, I think, as clinicians. So, uh, most of, oh, this title comes from um, Ori, who's an F2, one of the junior doctors, and I was going to, I'm going to do Grand Round soon, which is where um, we kind of present things to, doctors present cases and things to each other. And I said, oh, I was thinking of doing Grand Round about compassion. And he said, you're not going to call it compassion. Aren't you? No one's going to come if you're going to say you to Grand <laughs> So I said, well, Ori, what would I have to call it for you to want to come to Grand Round? And he said, zombies, question <laughs> mark. <laughs> then I would come. So I made this commentary for him called zombies, question mark. Um, most of my colleagues are reassuringly human. However, stress seems to turn them into zombies, question mark. Radiologists turn zombies when stops are limited. Scan rejected, the blue box is not filled in legibly, and the patient is in her 90s. <laughs> med student turns on being at end of placement, so I'm 20 med students. Done falls, done stroke, done shortness of breath, must find a reduced consciousness. <laughs> <That's laughs> <it's their sign laughs> <off. laughs> Purple people turn on being med process. Purple people for people who don't know, like the senior nursing hierarchy. Um, Purple alert, minus 200 beds, discharge, discharge, send them to the eye hospital. <laughs> they do to all my patients. <laughs> um, but sometimes the biggest threat, uh, and then this is me and one of the junior doctors. I just got, just got a call to say Mrs. Smith died. Oh good, that's one less to see. Sometimes the biggest threat is the zombie within. Um, 
So that's fine. I guess that's comics thinking about why practice is difficult. Um, comics can also say the unsayable. Um, and I wrote this um, comic for Jane Stokes, who's sitting at the front. Um, after a conversation we had about um, death and dying and how it's all about grief. And it's after Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. And it's how I react when my patient is dying. So, first stage is denial. Get me a bigger line. Call the anaesthetist in my gut. I think he's dying. Next stage, anger. Why didn't you call me sooner? Where's that anaesthetist in my gut? I think he's dying. Bargaining. If I can just get this line in and get him to ITU in my gut. I think he's dying. Depression. I should be able to save him. I'm a crap doctor. My gut even louder now. I think he's dying. Acceptance. Actually, I think he's dying. Should we start the LCP? That's the Liverpool Care Park. Um, so that's comics saying something that I probably couldn't <coughs> say in words, but I can draw it in a comment somehow. Um, Comics can be used to articulate arguments. So um, this next comic is about geriatric medicine and our place in the hospital um, and, and what we do about that. Really. And it's called Reflections of a Cute Geriatrician, and that's me trying to look cute. Um, and it's um, after Bourdieu, who was, I was reading Bourdieu at the time, he's a sociologist who writes about um, where you are in the, in the high, in status kind of terms. He writes about how much capital you've got. And, and, yeah, where you sit in the world, or in your social setting. So, and this again is based on a true story. Um, tomorrow my geriatrics ward becomes an acute elderly medicine ward. And that's a nurse saying acute geriatrics, ha ha, that's an oxymoron. And lots of people did say that to me when my ward became an acute geriatrics ward. Um, she laughs because in the field of the general hospital, um, so there's that picture again with the pediatric new build and the cardiology and gastroenterology um, as part of the new millennium wing and geriatrics in the very old block. Um, geriatrics occupies a lowly position. Um, so you've got neurosurgery at the top, uh, trauma surgery, also pretty cool. Cardiology are up there. Prescription medicine getting a bit less um, exciting, really. And geriatrics at the bottom um, of hospital medicine, really. Apart from psychiatrists, sorry, sorry, psychiatrists, yeah. um, who say it's okay for you, I'm not even in the general hospital. <laughs> As you know, we've moved psychiatry out and they now are in the community and kind of out of the way, even more stigmatised than geriatric. Um, so, how should geriatricians respond? <clears throat> well, we could rebrand, so this is half stop. Welcome to the hyper acute unit for slightly older persons. <laughs> make ourselves excited. Um, we could reappropriate, so um, so take the power back, you know, take the word back, geriatrics, rights for geriatrics, geriatricians against ageism. Um, or we could embrace our habitus. Um, so this is a patient arriving on my ward. This is Mrs. Berry, she's 87, her syncope is non-cardiac, her fractured humerus is non-orthopedic, her bladder cancer is inoperable, and the geriatrician says, okay, leave her with us. Um, so that's all my comics, and I think, um, in case you haven't got it, the point is um, that comics are a good way to explore clinical practice. They get under the surface of practice, they help you see the world from a new angle, um, they get you in touch with the intangible, and they help you understand things better. Um, exploring practice, I think, leads to better practice, which is good for the patient's health. Exploring practice also leads to increased psychological well-being, which is good for the practitioner's health. Therefore, comics are good for your health. So, hello, I'm Nicola Streeton, and I'm an illustrator. And um, I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to try and talk about look at the expertise and the gap that I think there is between expertise of lived experience and the expertise of learnt, ex uh, exper learnt, uh, learnt expertise. Um, because I think, I suggest there's a hierarchy and the reason I'm going to talk about that is because I think comics is good at telling about the experience, um, particularly with medicine. So. Um, 
I, to, to introduce myself, uh, this is the graphic novel I brought out, Billy, Me and You. So here's the cover, a lovely bright yellow, and we can see very clearly a memoir of grief and recovery. It's based on the story, the true story, that 16 years ago my two-year-old child died following surgery for um, uh, three car genetic, uh, no, what's it, uh, cardiac deformities that were diagnosed 10 days before he died. And so the story is about the grief that follows. But actually, I want to talk tonight about um, the process of making this work. And I just hope it makes sense, because I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, I really like this quote by Virginia Woolf. I meant to write about death, but life came crashing in, as usual. So when I started in 2001, I signed up to do an MA in design because I thought I was working as an illustrator, I was using text and image, and I wanted to do this big project, and I knew it was a big, it had been a big experience in my past. So I made two mistakes. I, I, um, I wanted to do a comic, which is why I put it in capital letters, and about death in, in capital letters. So this was a page from my first draft. I did the first run really quickly in six months and thought, yeah, this is easy. And then I realized I'd done it all wrong because I had this concept, this idea of what a comic should be, and I was forcing it. And I was also trying to tell the story of, the quite, of how I understood the medical process and the actual death. And then I was thinking, that's not going to tell anybody very much. Uh, and by this time I got frustrated with being in a design context, so I switched to do an, what's called an MRES, a Master of Research. It was still in the Art, Architecture and Design Department. It's the first part of a PhD, so you're learning research methodology. And again, I'd gone in with this thing that I was going to study academia. I was an academic, so I was reading a lot of books that um, were very difficult for me to read, often by French philosophers, and I was reading translations. They didn't make any sense to me, and I was writing it all out, and quite sturgid, boring way of writing, because in my head I thought that's what academia really has to be. So, um, all the time, though, my, and so alongside I was still drawing the big graphic novel, so my interest was, and still is, in people's reaction, reactions to my telling about grief rather than a story of death itself. So when I stood up, this is right in the very, very beginning, to present my proposal, still in the design um, context, to my fellow students. Uh, luckily there was an opportunity for critical feedback. And there we've got the same depressing subject matter, and someone saying, I don't like comics, and a couple of people asleep, and um, why wouldn't I read a normal novel and use my imagination? I don't need the pictures. Um, and all the time I was thinking, why are they responding like that? How interesting. Because of course I was thinking it was the most interesting story. And, that, and I'd, I'd already been exposed to comics doing something different. So um, I carried on, and so that's why I was reading up about it and carry on uh, sort of responding. And it's something um, Muna said about reflection, because I, because I was in this uh, master's level academia, that's what we are told. And also it's really useful, and I was reflecting. So other people's reactions to my experience was and is my personal experience. So this is from the book, and it's, um, it's we have driven up to, a, in, the, in the story, we have driven up to a parent's bereavement group. And um, the whole of the front thing was tarmac, the entire front garden's tarmac, not a plant in sight. Why do people do that? As I rocked up, and then it transpired that they did that immediately. Their child had died, and so again, it's it's I'm reacting to other people's grief, but I'm also uh, inviting the reader to react to my reaction. So it's all about <coughs> reactions. So my narrative um, became a reflection on how and why I, they, and we all react to grief and bereavement. So this is uh, one panel where I'm telling people that my child died and people reacted differently in the things they said. Oh, my friend's baby died. In fact, I helped her through it. So that's uh, my friend's reaction. And then my reaction to what she reacts is minus 20 out of 10 because it just annoys me at the time. So, um, 
So this is part where I kind of get, get I have, hope I make myself clear. My story's not about <coughs> death at all. That's how I feel it now. It's about my personal experience of death and grief. But my personal experience is based on your personal experience of me telling you. So my personal experience was and is shaped by your actions. So what on earth do I mean? And why is it relevant to this panel tonight? Well, I was thinking about there's uh, cars. So this is a nice drawing. If you asked a mechanic how does a car work, you'd get something like the uh, rocket, sh rocket, you know, and all this. And you'd get all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, it wouldn't mean anything to me. Um, but if I was to tell you how a car works, when my book has sold a few more copies, <laughs> this is the car I'm going to get, and that's probably going to be my house. That might even be me. I'm going to just drive down the country. There'll be no other cars or people. And when you see me, you will react to my new improved status. So you see, that's what I mean, the experience and the learn. So I still don't really know how a car works. And then also, Muna, I like the way your sister talks about drawings, because there are different types of drawings. So this is in a medical context. So medicine is science and academic, so this would be an academic drawing. But and also another um, handy thing with uh, Kubler-Ross. Uh, so the medicine I understand, I have no knowledge of science or the body. The heart is that shape for me, and even when we were in the hospital, John and myself struggled having uh, the medicine explained to us. Um, after our child died, this is a, a, a panel where I'm in a dentist, search, a dentist waiting room. You know where you pick up magazines and read. That's where most of my science comes from. So I, I was reading articles about stages of grief, but in this context. So um, here they are, whatever they are. Which, and then I just thought in that sort of a uh, five minute slot of reading I read through, I understand the stages of grief and I've done them, I'm cured. So this rather simplistic experience of medicine isn't quite probably how Kubler-Ross uh, did the studies that went around it. So um, why is the relevance of other people's reactions to my experience important? Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, the relevance of other people's reactions to my experience is important. Because other people's reactions are my own same reactions unexamined. So it's, it's, it's people, people react, we react quickly to something without reflecting on it. Whereas I, 16 years after the grief, had had a chance to reflect it and I also embedded my research within academia alongside it. Um, so I'd been researching about narrative, and I, and that I started my m -res in 2008. I, 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 I time out next month, so I'm doing the final write-up. And as with the graphic novel, it's a very slow process. We'll, uh, I'm sure Nye will agree, but um, it's the same for me with academia. I just wonder why we need to hurry. And the last <laughs> few months, it suddenly clicked. So this was... Um, very early on, the lecture series on my new course was good, but, and we were learning positiv positivism by men, phenomenology by men, structuralism by men, Marxism by men, postmodernism by men, semiotics by men, poststructuralism by men. What about feminism? I said. And, um, uh, luckily, I've come across this anecdotal theory recently by Jane Gallup. It was when I was telling a lecturer friend that my final research methodology would be feminism that I became aware of an assumed conflict between academic theory and feminism. She indicated this could be deemed an inadequate approach, that I would need to locate myself theoretically as, for example, a Marxist feminist, a structuralist feminist, or a postmodern feminist. <laughs> the implication was that feminism is not theoretical because it includes personal experience. I was somewhat startled. It also implied a requirement for feminism to be coupled, a heterosexual coupling, since the leading theoreticians 
of the other viewpoints we'd been introduced to were male. So that was the president. Oh, sorry, that's the president. So when, um, as I went along, uh, this was one of my tutors. My words about the death of my child. All oh, right, is it cathartic? Cathartic. So when people ask me, is your work about the death of your child cathartic? It startled me because the journey of the process of making it was nothing to do with cathartic <coughs> therapy. It was about an examination of learning and questioning the assumptions that we make alongside my questioning and learning about how academia operates. It wasn't didactic, that's the other thing, which um, sometimes academia can be. So here's, um, during the book, I um, position myself as narrator, ask, narrator position now in the present time, asking out to the reader uh, questions as I go along. Why is funeral etiquette so unclear to us? when death is as common as birthdays and marriage. So why the comic form? Well, I think um, this is one of the best panels that, uh, that ex explains it. Um, John, uh, who was the, now my husband at the time, the father of Billy, um, he had been, to set the context, he'd been teaching in adult education and he'd had time off after Billy died, and a colleague of, it, of, it, of his at the time had told his students, when John comes back, don't mention the dead child, because it will upset him, and without conferring to John. So John came back to work, no one said anything. Meanwhile, I had been going to my work, back to work, and everyone had said, oh, sorry about your child's dead, blah, blah, blah. And I had been talking about it openly. So he was really, really upset. And he came back, I hate that tutor for, oh, then one of the students came and told him, which is how I found out, I hate that tutor for doing that to me. On the tube I wrote her letter, listen, <laughs> good idea. But maybe wait a bit before sending. And um, last week, uh, Francois Matarasso, on his blog, Parliament of Dreams, uh, reviewed, reviewed the book and picked up this. And I'm just going to read what he said. John's anger is clear in the quick, hard lines of the eyes, while his dark hat sits on his head like the lid of a boiling pan. The softer lines and staring eyes of Nicola's face expre express her anxiety as clearly as her cautious words. But it is the middle speech bubble that can only work in a comic. Listen, says John. But his carefully composed letter is represented simply as a stream of handwritten hate. His actual thoughts, which literally don't matter, are turned into a visual sign whose cramped edges say it all. The word hate is both text and image and neither. It expresses a truth that can only be communicated in the panel of a comic. And then I wanted to talk about um, after publication of the book because the reactions continue and, and I question them the whole time and I question my reaction to the reactions. Um, when um, the reviews, the, the first reviews, the newspaper reviews tell a different story. They picked on the human story of grief and death and they talk about the growing up of comics, which actually I disagree with. I think the strength of comics is that because they're not grown up and because we think of them as childish, so we're, we're, um, when it deals with difficult subject matter, we're taken slightly by surprise. It's unexpected. Um, and uh, the letters I received following uh, articles such as The Guardian about the terrible grief and sorrow uh, were people's stories of their own sorrows, which I found fascinating. Um, all right, then um, I received an email from a friend. Uh, she copied in a response from the, her aunt, who she'd given the book to. And I'll just read that out. The graphic novel you gave me that I tossed aside, I picked it up again as you clearly liked it. It is an excellent, moving, and true book. I worked out, somewhat painfully, why I rejected it at first. My unconscious thought, which I had to drag up into consciousness, was, huh, so she lost a little boy, and it wasn't her fault. What can she know of grief? 
Of course, this is inaccurate, both in my case and hers. It is an honest testament. I'm very glad to have read it. And my friend says this was from my aunt. Her daughter, my cousin, killed herself, age 27. And actually, emails like that were some of the best endorsements I received. And then here's a letter. <laughs> I have to read all these things up. OK, in February, I uh, received a, re a letter from the parent of a friend of mine who'd read the book. So it's really nice to get letters through the post. She's fairly elderly. Um, I found the idea of a graphic novel treating such a tragic subject so very strange. I can think of very few things worse than losing a child, and to write about it in that way seemed somehow to trivialize it. I must admit that I wasn't familiar with the genre. So I thought that's really interesting, and I thought that again is the beauty of the comic form, because you think it's something light, and then it allows you to um, go into it. And then on the third page, no, second page, she wrote, another reservation I had at the outset was to be rather surprised that someone with obvious design, drawing ability would illustrate the book in such a simplistic style a form which seemed rather lacking in skill, <laughs> <laughs> at least initially. So um, that again is, uh, remember I showed you the first panel when I was really keen that it should be a proper comic, and then as the drawing went it becomes quite loose, and I think again the rawness of the line suits the subject. So here's my conclusion, uh, which I throw out to you. The low art form of comics, which historically it is, is suited to the low status of experience to create new knowledge and new understanding by challenging our expectations. Again, expectations, isn't that a word you use? Importance in medicine, it enables a wider reach to health professionals and patients, as well as an educative reach to the wider public through offering a source of empathetic entertainment. And have I run out of time? Can I have five minutes more? Um, I thought then I'd, so I've gone through this process and I really enjoyed it both within academia and within creatively and I've just received uh, Arts Council funding to research and develop my next project <laughs> and um, it's, it's really interesting, uh, again I'm finding it interesting, the very early stages because I feel more confident in my position uh, academically and more confident about just going with the process and following what interests me and people's reaction. Uh, it, it's really at first, I mean it's been a couple of months now, but when, I, when people ask what's your next book about, <clears throat> it's about choices around pregnancy. I couldn't quite bring myself <laughs> to say the word abortion because, and I wondered why, it's still like there's a slight taboo. Uh, and also, you know, I told uh, I told, I said it to my daughter who went, oh, how boring. <laughs> so it's back to that. It's like death, abortion, oh, how dull. And, um, but it's, it's, so I'm just going to go very briefly through um, some of my initial findings. The challenge for me with this one, with the first one, it was very clearly a memoir. This will not, the challenge is to make it fiction, but I, not a memoir, but it will be based on personal experience because I think the process of making a graphic novel has to be in the sense that it's people's reactions and my reactions and my reactions to their reactions. So it's also, again, it's relevant to this panel because it's about medical and the law is very clear, but the experience or how people respond seems to be very emotive. Um, oh yeah, I was going to start off by showing you um, the merchandise which has really captivated me because I've been speaking to, you can't see it, but ask me on. I've been speaking to the pro-choice, and this is the other thing, pro-choice or pro-life, I get muddled up. Which side are you on? Well, I'm pro-choice, but I'm also pro-life, aren't I? Or if I'm pro-choice, choice, am I anti-life, if I'm pro-life? So it's this, um, immediately I'm confused, even though in my head I know well, clear. So I went to speak to the pro-choice because I thought they will be really sure, and um, a, a retired doctor, he brought on a visa, and he said, how can anyone say this isn't a baby? And, and if you look at it, well, and I, I see his point, it's a cute little thing, but I thought, crikey, if I um, had given birth to something that looked like that, I would have been quite alarmed. And then it made me, I took it home and, and my sister said, wow, that's so sweet. Um, do they come in black? 
you know, do they come with deformities? So again, no, I've only seen these lovely little pink ones. And I think this was from the Baptists, but the Catholics ones are much more robust. And I think they put a lot more money into their merchandise. And I, then, I, then someone said, well, if, if the graphic novel doesn't come in, there's a gap in the market. <laughs> Um, and then the recurring, and then finally the recurring words, which are murder and selfish, which just hangs around in my mind. So I think I've got, I haven't done any drawing yet, but um, I think it's, I'm going to have a lovely eight years ahead, because that's how long it takes. And thank you.